Good morning. I thought this was a good morning. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> it's beautiful out there today. <laughs> Might be a little bit cool on the cool side, but it's so beautiful. And it's always great to be in God's house. Even though our numbers are somewhat diminished today, as Steve said, a lot of people uh, are traveling uh, this morning, and so we miss them. So Steve was left with all the work this morning. He had to do, ever, do everything. Uh, but it's good to be here in God's house. And it's good to see some returning visitors. We're glad to have you with us. We're glad that you are here with us this morning. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Father, we give thanks that we can come into your house and into your presence, that we can come boldly into your presence because Jesus Christ has opened the way for us. How wonderful it is to know, Lord, that we can come to you as a loving father, knowing that you care for us, knowing that you love us, knowing that you are waiting to bless us. Help us now, Lord, that we might be open to what it is that you have ready for us. That we might accept it and that we might apply it to our lives so that we can go out and live to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I think we can in general terms at least agree that winter can be a beautiful time of year. Uh, especially on a day like today. Drive-in was gorgeous this morning, sun shining, traffic was light, uh, it, was, it was really nice. And yet, we can also agree that winter at times can be a very trying and difficult times. And during times like that, my patience wears thin, and I cannot wait for spring to arrive. I mean, I'm looking for it now already, I know it's got a ways to go, but that'll be the time, you know, when the grass starts to change color from that brown that it is in the winter and the trees start to bud and the crocuses and daffodils peep out of the lawns and wherever they might be planted. Uh, then when I take that drive from home to here and drive past the fields and farms, life comes into bloom again. Uh, everything that you see then is an indication of the vigor of new life. And more specifically, it's an indication of the growth that is contained in that new life. And that's not just beautiful to look at, but it really ought to bring with it the recognition that there is something in all of this that is not only marvelous to behold, but actually something miraculous. Why do you say miraculous? Because there's a power at work here which goes beyond anything else I know of in nature. Think about it. In spring, <clears throat> we take a small seed we place it in the ground, and within a matter of a few months or even weeks, that seed develops into a magnificent plant and ultimately will provide a bountiful harvest. Now, we may take that for granted, especially when you live in a city and aren't exposed to what goes on and around on the farms and stuff like that. We may take that for granted, but we have to recognize that there is a power, a force at work here that goes beyond almost anything else we know. A pastor that I know from California, when he traveled, always took with him a small seed. He always kept that in his wallet. He used it as an illustration for some things. And when he showed it to people, he'd always ask them if they knew what kind of seed it was. And since he was a pastor, their first thought, obviously, was, it's got to be a mustard seed. Good guess, but they would have been wrong. They would have been wrong. 
even though the seed he carried wasn't altogether too much bigger than a mustard seed, it was a seed for something else. And then he'd go on to explain or describe the plan that this seed would ultimately produce. It was a plant that could grow to the height of a 34-story building. In other words, about 300 feet high or more. The trunk of it, this plant could reach a diameter of 35 feet. In other words, a circumference, you know, around the trunk of 110 feet. And it could weigh up as much as 2,000 tons. Tiny seed to 2,000 tons. Now, obviously, the seed he was carrying was that of the giant sequoia, you know, the big redwood trees. Now, obviously, it takes a long time for that seed to grow into that kind of a plant. But just think of the possibilities. If you'd begin with a handful of those seeds and a lot of patience, a lot of patience, you actually hold in your hand enough lumber to build all the houses of a small city. Or consider the parable Jesus told about the sower and the four kinds of soil. I think most of you remember that. And do you remember how that parable ends up? It ends up with a good soil that produces a harvest of how many fold? A hundredfold. Again, consider the implications of that power of growth. One mathematician went to the trouble of computing this power of growth. And he began with one bushel of corn. Well, if you plant a bushel of corn and it returns a hundredfold, you know, what would you get? He figured it out to 15 years worth. From that one bushel after the first year, you obviously get a hundred bushels. Then you plant those hundred bushels, and the second year, you end up with 10,000 bushels. The third year, you plant those 10,000 bushels, and you end up with a million bushels. Fourth year, a hundred million bushels. And then the numbers really start to take off. By the time you get to the 15th year, you could take all that corn, hollow out the earth, and fill that earth with that corn. Not just once, not just twice, not just three times, but 31 and a half million times. That is a power of growth God has placed within very simple things in nature. That is a power we see renewed every year in spring, summer, and fall as we see the seeds sprout and grow and ripen for the harvest. And that is the principle of growth, not just for plants, but that principle of growth manifests itself in a multitude of different ways. Consider a newborn baby. You can take that baby in your hands, look at it, hold him in your arms. Tell me, is there anything more dependent, more helpless than a baby cradled in your arms? And yet, what potential is there? What potential is there? What possibilities of growth? You know, when we read about the boy Jesus, that he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, it reminds us that Jesus was once that helpless babe in the manger, remember? And yet, how can we ever forget what became of him? What a reminder that ought to be for us of the power of life and growth.
And now when we contemplate that power, there are a couple of things that we should note about it. And this is where the parables we read earlier come in. Because they're talking about the power of growth. And the first of the things that we ought to take note of is that this power is at work in spite of what we may do or what we may fail to do. Let me read again part of the parable. A little bit, little bit different translation. God's kingdom is like a seed thrown on a field by a man who then goes to bed and forgets about it. The seed sprouts and grows. He has no idea how it happens. The earth does it all without his help. First a green stem of grass, then a bud, then the ripened grain. Do you notice? As soon as that seed is grown, this power goes into action. The process proceeds whether we want it to or not. Uh, one of my favorite pastors is the pastor who was my pastor during my teenage years. Uh, I love to listen to him. I've tried to pattern my ministry after his. I haven't succeeded. He was a heck of a lot better at it than I was. But one of the things he was really great at was telling stories. And he told one story that just stuck with me. He said he grew up on a small family farm. Now, he's passed away, what, 30 years ago? So this goes way back when he was a young boy. But he grew up on a small family farm, and much of the work on that farm still had to be done by hand. And when they planted corn, they had a horse-drawn machine that put the seed into the ground. It was somewhat automatic, but it didn't work very well. And very often there would be whole sections that remained unseated because the machine malfunctioned. Well, the father had given him a bag of corn, and he was supposed to go over the spots that had been missed and put the seed in there by hand. Well, he said, it was such a hot day, and the work was tiring, you know, when you constantly have to bend down and put the stuff in the ground. Uh, and he was thirsty and bored, and he wanted to quit, but he still had about half of his bag of corn left to plant. So he simply dug a hole in the ground, put the corn in, covered it up with dirt, tamped it down with his foot, and went home. He figured that was the end of it. He had planted all the corn. He forgot something. What's planted will grow whether you wanted to or not. And when the father went past the field a couple of weeks later, he knew exactly what had happened. Because there, in that one little spot, there were a hundred sprouts of corn coming up out of the ground. Uh, one little patch, what was planted, grew. It's no different with anything else in life. What we plant will grow. Everything has its consequences. Do you remember the encounter of King David with Bathsheba? How he saw her bathing on the rooftop of a neighboring house? How he allowed himself to be tempted by what he saw? He allowed a seed to be planted. And once he allowed that seed to be planted, it wasn't long before the plant grew. He gave in to temptation, and he never dreamed of what kind of a harvest that would bring. Now, later on, he confessed his sin. He was truly sorry for it. He repented of his sin. His repentance was as deep as it could be. You can read about it. Go to Psalm 51 and read about how he asked God to restore a new spirit with him, give him a new clean heart. But what he had planted grew. The harvest was there. 
And David had to watch as his deed, even years later, created havoc, not just within his own family, but in the nation of Israel as well. He had repented and God forgave him, clearly. When we confess God is faithful, he forgives, he cleanses us. But that doesn't mean the consequences. It doesn't mean the harvest is suddenly taken away. What we plan will grow whether we want it to or not. As Paul says in Galatians, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And that brings me directly to the second point. While we have no control over whether or not something we sow will grow or not, because it will, it will produce a harvest, we do have something to say about what it is that we're sowing. We have control over that. We live in a world that functions according to certain specific God-given laws. And as I said, that means that the good as well as the bad will sprout and will bear fruit in its time. It is just as God said in the beginning of creation, let the earth burst forth with every sort of grass and seed-bearing plant and fruit trees and seeds inside the fruit so that these seeds will produce the kind of plants and fruits they came from or as the King James says, after their own kind. If you plant corn, expect to see corn stalks growing. If you're foolish enough to spread dandelion seed, well, you got a lot of weeding to do afterwards. If you choose that which is opposed to God, this power of growth can produce a Judas who betrayed Jesus, If you choose that which is pleasing to God, that which is righteous, that same power can turn a John, the son of thunder, into a John, the apostle of love. The power is the same. It's there for each of us. But by our choice of the seed, we determine whether it's going to become a power for light or for darkness. And then there's a third thing about this power of growth, and that is that it usually manifests itself gradually. It takes time to show itself. Now, we've been living in our home about 10 years. When that house was built, 10 years ago, almost 11 years ago now, they put in an asphalt driveway. Suddenly, last summer, right in the middle of that driveway, a plant came up. After 10 years, there was a seed under there, and it grew. 10 years it took. Now, while in a certain sense we both sow and harvest every day, on the whole, the process of growth moves along slowly. It's a gradual process. And there's a real danger in that. Because when the fruit, when the harvest, when the consequences don't show themselves immediately, it tends to give a false sense of security. It convinces us that nothing bad is going to happen, that somehow we don't have to be concerned about the consequences. After 10 years, the driveway should have been fine, right? And because the consequences don't show themselves immediately, we start to think like the people the prophet Zephaniah talks about when he says they are people who think God doesn't do anything, good or bad. He isn't involved. Or the ones that the psalmist has in mind when he says the Lord doesn't see it, the God of Jacob doesn't even pay attention to it. And we totally forget that just because the fruit isn't there right away, it doesn't mean it's not going to appear somewhere along the line. 
But it's exactly that reality that Satan uses to tempt us. He shows us the pleasurable aspects, the things that we can experience right away, the immediate gratification that makes us feel good. And then he tells us not to worry about what may or may not come along down the road. In other words, he tries to hide the real cost from us. It's the same principle um, you know, car dealers, stores use in their advertising. No payments for three months. No interest until a year from now. In other words, you can enjoy it now. You can have it today. Don't worry about the cost. That's all in the future. You can deal with it then or whenever. The pleasure, the good part, that you can all have now. Now, I'm not trying to criticize installment buying. It has its place. But the point is, that is what Satan uses. Here, have it all, now. But not one word about the bill that comes later. And the thing is, even when we see other people stuck with dealing with the consequences, we never think it's going to happen to us. We'll get through it. We don't have to worry about it. And remember, Satan's a good salesman. The good he gives right away, but the bill is going to come. No exceptions. And anybody who thinks that they are the exception are only fooling themselves because we'll have to pay and we'll have to pay with interest. Satan doesn't let us get away with even one penny. So as I said, no exceptions. Every seed we plant will grow. It will bear fruit. It will lead to a harvest. And once that seed is sown, it's out of our hands. Then we don't have a choice anymore. The only choice we have is what kind of seed we sow before we sow it. And that leads me directly to the last point. Not only do we have a choice on what kind of seed we sow, we must make the choice. Only you and I personally can make that choice for our own lives. Nobody else can ever make it for us. And as I said, we must make a choice because the reality is we are always sowing something whether it's for good or bad or indifferent, we're always planting something. Some word, some deed, some attitude, some example. We can't get away from it. It's part of life. And it won't help us to ignore the whole matter either. It won't help us to plead indifference. We can't simply take things as they come and not worry about them. God will take care of the outcome. We can't think that way. What happens if a farmer doesn't bother to check what kind of seed he plants in his field? How do you think he'll fare if he says, I'll take whatever comes along and let God take care of it? What kind of a harvest do you think he'll get? It's no different in our lives. When we fail to consciously choose, we're saying that we're not concerned about the harvest. When we fail to consciously choose, we're saying that our life and what we do with it doesn't matter. We're saying that it makes no difference what kind of example we set. We're saying that we're not concerned about whether or not God is glorified. But the point is it all does matter. You know it as well as mine. And therefore we must choose because we will harvest what we sow. I wonder how many of you have ever heard of John Livingston. I know most of you have heard of the great missionary David Livingston. But how about John? Ever hear of him? He was David's brother. He was David's brother. The two boys grew up together in Scotland, had the same parents, same home, same basic instructions for life, 
basically they had the same upbringing. As they got older, each one of these two men made a choice about their own life. John determined that he was going to make a name for himself. Acquire wealth, become rich, powerful. He placed all of his energy into achieving that goal. For David, the most important thing in his life was following Christ. He took to heart the command of Jesus, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He stated, I will place no value on anything I have except in relation to the kingdom of Christ. John achieved his goal. He lived in luxury and wealth. David lived 30 years in the wilderness in the wild jungles of Africa. When John died, he was one of the wealthiest men in Ontario, Canada. David died kneeling beside a bed in a small hut in Zambia. However, when John died, the only thing of note in his obituary column was the fact that he was the brother of David Livingston. When David's body was brought back to England in 1874, it became a national day of mourning. His body was laid to rest in Westminster Abbey. And today, there's a national memorial to David Livingston housed in the original mill workers' tenement where he was born. Who made the better choice? Who sowed a more worthwhile seed? Who had a greater harvest? And if that difference is already recognized here on earth, as it was with these two men, can you imagine what it's going to be like in heaven? We all are sowers. We sow seed with our lives, in our lives. And that seed, whatever it is, will bring a harvest. Therefore, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. It's up to you. It's up to you. You choose the seed. What choices are you making today? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we need to come to you right now. Because without your guidance, we don't even know what seed to choose to sow in our lives. We need your direction. We need your help. We need your wisdom. Lord, Help us to make the proper choices, the right choices. Not the choices that will make us great, but the choices that will glorify you. Help us to see. And then, Lord, help us to plant so that you can provide the growth. In Jesus' name.